sitting here all ready to record my thoughts on this a latest episode of SmackDown, that brand's go-home show for SummerSlam, and just before I press the record button, something stops me, and I have one of those voices in my head. You know, like, Randy Orton gets those voices, my voices didn't tell me to RKO people and kick their fucking head off their shoulders, they just told me to do something very simple. Go back and watch that Miz TV segment from SmackDown again, and I'm sitting there like, what the hell? I already watched that segment already. Like, I really don't need to hear Dolph Ziggler and his manic-ass promo style again. Him screaming at me and all of that. I don't need to hear it again. I saw it the first time. I understood what was going on. But that, that voice just insisted. Go back and watch that Miz TV segment with Ambrose and Ziggler again. So, I obliged. I went back and I watched the segment. And this time around... I gave them the benefit of the doubt because originally I was watching it and I was like, yada, 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 here they go, just going through the motions here, just pushing this thing from point A to point B, no real significant development. But I will say though that um, super kick out of nowhere from Ziggler, just in the middle of his, you know, manic ass speech when he kicked Dean Ambrose, that was cool the first time around and every single time I saw it after that. But this time around, I focused on the words that they were saying to each other and I wrote down a few of. Dean Ambrose says lines directed towards Dolph Ziggler. He said, and I quote, you don't like pressure. That's why you've never just grabbed the ball and scored a touchdown. You don't want it bad enough. You've never wanted it bad enough and you're never going to get it. And I was sitting there, like I said, trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, attempting to piece together a story out of what was going on. And damn it, I think I got it. I think I got it. So I'm sitting there and I'm listening to Dean Ambrose and it's very clear to me that he's sending the message to Dolph Ziggler that, dude, you are not good enough and you know you're not good enough. But over these years, you've made excuses for your mediocrity to placate your fans like you've Push the message onto them. Like all of those people talking about, oh, Dolph Ziggler, WWE should really do something with Dolph Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler should get a push. Dolph Ziggler should be a shoe in for a world championship reign or whatever it may be. Just give the guy a push. Give him some attention or something. And what Dean Ambrose is out there saying is that Dolph Ziggler has placated those fans by attempting to craft this narrative that I'm not a main eventer because I'm being held down. I'm not a main eventer because I'm not getting an opportunity to be one. Because it's it's much easier to face that rather than acknowledge the crushing reality that the reason why you're not a main eventer is because you're not good enough to be one. Because when you finally get that opportunity that you've been complaining about never having, you'll realize that once you get there, you don't belong there because you're not good enough. And that's why... You're in the position that you're in in WWE and realize I'm not saying I believe this about Dolph Ziggler. I'm saying that that is what Dean Ambrose was out there and he was saying. And as I'm listening to all of those words, I was like, God damn it. I really like this. Like, I like the story that's playing out. And then Dean Ambrose is going further and he's talking about this chip that Dolph Ziggler has on his shoulder. And I look at that and I, you know, I'm thinking that Dean Ambrose is meaning something like, you were a con man selling this BS to the fans throughout all of these years, but you just so happened to win a fluke match for the number one contendership after the brand split. And now that same bullshit story that you were selling to the fans, you're believing that yourself right now. And that's going to lead to your downfall. And when I look at all of this and I piece together that story, I have to give WWE props for telling it with some authenticity and being genuine in their approach with Dolph Ziggler being the number one contender to the WWE Championship. Because the reason why I was so pissed off about Dolph Ziggler being named as a number one contender is because I know what WWE does when they get into situations like this. They want to tell these Cinderella stories and, you know, act like you know, oh, Dolph Ziggler, he's all dolled up with his glass slippers. What, Cinder? He was in the basement scrubbing floors? I don't know what you're talking about. What the hell? Like, they want to make it as if these last few years of Dolph Ziggler and WWE, they never existed. Then this is a time when they want to keep reminding us that he's a two-time world champion. And, you know, oh, he's this and he's that. And he had all of these great moments. But they're telling this story with some authenticity in a sense that, they're not letting him off the hook for 
a pretty mediocre run in WWE for these, you know, for this last year and a half or whatever it may be. Like they're acknowledging that and they're bringing it into the storyline and storyline and they're letting Dean Ambrose go out there and they're letting him talk about it. And that was my biggest issue that they were going to basically piss on my leg and tell me it was raining. I don't want that. I want the damn truth and I'm getting some reality and what's going on, an accurate assessment of who Dolph Ziggler is in the world of WWE, and they can use that as a catalyst to turn him into something different. Like, don't just flip on a dime, like, actually get some development out of it. And what I'm seeing right now, it definitely is development, and it's gotten me to a point right now where I'm looking at this and saying, okay, I can rock with this, and boom, there you go. So let's talk about a few more things from this latest episode of SmackDown. This whole saga that's going on with <laughs> the tag team uh, division, it is so funny because the first night on the roster that American Alpha, you know, they were there, they beat the Vaude Villains, and <laughs> WWE quickly realized the error in their ways, and they're like, oh, goddamn, we can't have the Vaude Villains just go through and run through the whole fucking roster because, you know... It's pretty thin over there. We have to have those teams maintain something, you know, whatever it is that they have right now. We can't just immediately crush it. We have to maintain it and then, I guess, see in the future how they're going to build to it. So they had a jobber tag team last week and then they had this um, 12 man tag team match to face teams versus the heel teams and American Alpha they still get the win so this is like a juggling act from WWE how do we continue to get American Alpha all of these wins in their you know win column but don't have them completely run through the roster and ex expose it for you know it being as thin as it is and they keep trying and you know I'll give you a little clap to it, but I'm wondering what, uh, where do we go from here? How do you establish a team that's credible enough to deliver a believable feud with American Alpha when they finally do introduce those, ta those tag team championships? Like, are you going to build up a team outside of American Alpha, like one of the heel teams, build them? Because you can't build them in the same orbit of American Alpha because they'll be completely fucking crushed. Or could you like turn a team like the Usos heel and just that heel turn it'll propel them forward with a bit of momentum and that you could work with that also acknowledging the fact that they are the second you know most legit tag team in uh, smackdown's tag team division and they're a face team so how do you work around that yeah I'm, I, I, it's still a lot of questions for the tag team division and you know i look forward to seeing how they're going to answer those questions now let's move on to the women's division i was looking at what happened on the show tonight and naomi she came out there with her little glow in the dark stuff and um she had a new gimmick which i said on twitter she's her gimmick is basically a walking rave because she comes out there with the dubstep music is it dubstep shit i don't know i'm I'm, I'm, I'm not hip with what the kids are into these days. I know it sounds like electro dance music, that EDM bullshit that's completely taken over the radio. You know, you're, you're, you're driving home from work, you know, four o'clock in the fucking afternoon and they're playing club music like this is a Saturday night at one in the morning. But beside the point, but um, yeah, she had that little EDM music and the glow in the dark stuff and um, throwing shit into the crowd and very fun gimmick. I just hope it doesn't put a ceiling to Naomi and her potential in this SmackDown women's division because with the, the divisions splitting, somebody needs to take those top spots in the division because you have the top two women in um, WWE over on Raw and Charlotte and Sasha Banks and we're going to need somebody to fill those positions over on SmackDown and I just hope that this very like party like gimmick is it a top tier gimmick for the women like could she succeed with this could she possibly be a champion with a gimmick like that because you have other people like um uh, you know Becky Lynch and Natalia there's a bit of legitimacy there I don't think who uh, Alexa Bliss is could hold her back from a championship and Carmella I don't I don't know 
shit. I, I, I don't know about her. That That's a whole little, another animal in and of itself right there. I guess we'll talk about that at a later date. But I want nothing but the best from Naomi. I'm hoping that she has, a you know, room to grow and prosper over on SmackDown. Because I'll never forget that fucking promo from last year on SmackDown. I think it was in May. Her and uh, Paige. Oh, my God. I love that promo so much. And... You know, I, I'm kind of looking at it like, God damn, why couldn't they go back to that character and let us see a resolution to that or, you know, see that play out on a week to week basis in WWE, that militant, militant Naomi where it's like, you know what, I'm not asking anymore. I'm not about that dancing and all of that bullshit. I'm going to take what I want. And yeah, that was cool. But, you know, and not necessarily saying that what I get from Naomi now is bad, but it's just different. And I'm hoping it doesn't put a ceiling to her success. Elsewhere in the women's division, actually, this isn't elsewhere because it kind of relates to her, too. Um, she was supposed to have a match with Eva Marie on SmackDown, but they're doing the Eva Marie gimmick where she continues to delay her debut. And this time around, it was traffic issues. She couldn't get to the arena. And later on, she shows up during a tag team match. Um, featuring some other uh, women in the division. And I was looking at it, and I was like, God damn, like, we're finally getting an in-ring competition here with the women as they try to figure out what their positions are in the division as we anticipate this um, as-yet-to-be-named Women's Championship making its way to the brand. And I just don't want Eva Marie to be that type of person that sucks up all of the fucking oxygen out of the room, where it's like anytime she shows up, nothing else can go on in the women's division. And it looked as if it was going to be that way until Naomi came out. She's like, oh, yeah, chick, I see you're here now. About that match, though, like, what's up? Square up. I like that. That was pretty cool. So they find a way to tie it back into, you know, the division overall and make sure that Eva Marie wasn't the only one getting a little bit of shine there. What else do I have to talk about from this show? Um, AJ Styles on commentary. Mm -mm. You clearly did not eat your bootios because you were very low energy on commentary. And as Donald Trump would say, sad. Low energy AJ, sad. He was sitting there and David Otunga... Bless his heart. He was trying to pull something out of AJ. Just trying to get something out of the fucking dude. But he was just there, like, throwing out talking points and keywords. You know how everyone says they want WWE to be like, you know, backstage when they structure promos and stuff like that? Just give people bullet points. Don't give them a script. Just give them bullet points, major points that they need to hit. And send them out there and let them fill in the rest. It's like AJ Styles got that paper with the bullet points on there and he didn't fill in the fucking rest. He just gave his little, you know, um, major points that he had to hit. Oh, this is my time. And, you know, John Cena's time is up and my time is now and the future is now. And he was very plain and, like I said, low energy. And David Otunga was trying to pull something out of him. And lo and behold, JBL, after years, finally fucking showed up on commentary and I got to give him his props. He was, um... He, he stepped in for AJ and he was because uh, Otunga was there talking about everything that John Cena does out of the ring. And JBL was like, I don't give a damn about any of that stuff when it comes to the subject of respect, because the way that you earn respect in the WWE is not out there. It's in the ring. And I respect John Cena. And the reason why I respect him is because when he had the opportunity to face me in the ring, he beat me in the middle of the ring. And if he wants respect from AJ Styles, then he has to do exactly that same thing to him. And I was like, okay, JBL, I like it. You know, we couldn't get that from AJ, but we got it from somebody. And that added a bit to the story. Uh, as far as John Cena being dominant at the end of the show, I mean, that was good stuff. Uh, even though I have to say this feud is... It never really regained the steam that it had before Money in the Bank. It had so many missteps it had to deal with um, since then. That stupid-ass um, finish of the match. Also, it had to deal with being thrown to the wayside you know, because of the brand extension. It had to battle back from a lot. But if we can get half the match that we got from those guys and half the performance that AJ Styles put on at Money in the Bank, we're definitely in for a good show between these two at SummerSlam. What else did I want to talk about? Um, Heath Slater. Heath Slater and the Jobber with the Heart of Gold gimmick. Um, that guy is one of my favorite uh, things to see on Raw or SmackDown on a week-to-week -week basis. He is really knocking this out of the friggin' park. And he's so endearing and passionate with what he does that... 
you know, uh, I didn't get to upload my review for Raw uh, last night, but just listening to Heath Slater and the passion that he has when he's talking, like, I honestly don't know what the hell the truth is. I don't know if Heath Slater has two kids, 14 kids, no kids at all. All I'm doing is, I, like, I, I'm just looking at Heath Slater like, please give this guy a damn job, sign him, give him a contract, make sure he can feed his damn family because... He's so endearing and entertaining with this role that he's playing. And I will say, though, that what happened on SmackDown, it was a lot more effective building towards the actual match that WWE was attempting to promote, Randy Orton versus Brock Lesnar, than the segment with Brock and Heath on Raw. Because out of that segment, shit, I didn't care about Randy Orton and Brock Lesnar. I could be, I cared about Heath Slater. I was like, oh, shit, what's going to happen with Heath Slater? Um, but... Randy Orton, I, maybe that's because Randy Orton has more to prove than Brock Lesnar does going into um, SummerSlam. So me seeing Brock Lesnar whoop Heath Slater's ass doesn't really do anything. But me seeing Randy Orton go a little bit crazy and give us a little glimpse of the type of person that he's going to be in the ring with Brock Lesnar. I guess maybe that was the situation more shit. Heath Slater was just that damn good. And they could be either or, but yeah, coming out of Raw, I was more interested in Heath Slater than I was Brock Lesnar. I should definitely say something, but um, yeah, that's it for this video. And let me know your thoughts on SmackDown, all of the things that I discussed, that little um, story that I pieced together for um, Dolph Ziggler and Dean Ambrose. And I'm glad I brought that up to circle back around to, uh, you know, our starting point in this video because I have an announcement to make. Um, I, as you guys know, I've been calling that title right there the Super Intercontinental Championship. Based off of what I saw on SmackDown tonight, I'm ready to give them an upgrade. So it is no longer the Super IC Championship. It's now the Super Duper Intercontinental Championship. Boom. There you go. I'm drawing the fucking line right there. Don't pressure me, Steven. I don't want to hear it because you know you're getting it on PWF Empire Live tomorrow. And that's the only thing I'm giving you. Super duper Intercontinental Championship. And it better be enough. Um, <laughs> thank you guys for tuning in to this video. Catch you later. Peace.